Welcome from My Slice of Life, where I'm helping to bring more joy into yours. This is the My Slice of Life podcast. Hello and a very warm welcome to you. This is the My Slice of Life podcast. If this is your first time here, thanks very much for stopping by. If you've come back after listening to a previous episode, God love you. There's not many of you, so I really appreciate it. This week, um, I'm going to be talking to you about five lessons I have learned from the garden so far this year. This is not going to be one of those philosophical, I have learned patience, I have... No, this is actual proper gardening lessons I have learned this year. But before we get to that, oh God boys, what a week it's been. Oh man. If you've been paying attention, the last two episodes that I did were about dealing with stress and I have been listening to my own advice. What a blooming week we've had. We've had a trip to the dentist that you can imagine the nerves. Poor poor boy. Poor boy had to go to the dentist and he, he thought it was going to be hell on earth and it, it turned out so much better. But you know when you get all that before you go to an appointment, especially kids, you know, kids and dentists, it's, it's never a great combination. But it worked out really, really well. What hasn't worked out so well, of course, is um, the car has had to go in for its MOT. If you're not from the UK, that's just like a, a annual test. They put the car through to see how much money they can make out of you. That seems to be what it is. And of course, every year they're going to find something wrong with your car, especially a car as old as ours. Um, what's, ours is from 2006, so it's ancient. I think we, we bought it from the Flintstones. It's still going by some sort of miracle and every year we get a massive bill and a list of problems. So we put it in yesterday, they phoned up and said yep it's failed and yep it's going to cost a fortune to fix. So we'll deal with that at some point. On top of that of course then dear son, I don't know if it's the stress or what it was, he's he's become unwell, he's had to go to bed last night, he's ill, I'm not feeling fantastic, I don't know what it is. We've all got headaches and we're feeling tired and and it's not carbon monoxide poisoning because we've got alarms for that. I don't know. Anyway, that is not, none of that, she says stretching, none of that is what the garden has taught me this year. So, back to the plan. What have I learned? Oh, I've learned to get my notes in order, have I? Okay, if you don't know, we have an allotment, which I take care of. We also have a very small garden at the house front and back which I take care of (laughs) yeah I do all the gardening I do pretty much everything here but I do enjoy the gardening now our allotment is it's 10 meters by 20 meters which I actually found that out in feet in case you are more of a feet person where did I put it's about 32 feet by 65 feet according to all the converter things that I could find now I've split that, we've got four main growing bays for veg. They're all about four and a half metres by five, which is 14 feet by 16 feet roughly. So we've got four of them. So they've got one for the potatoes, one for brassicas, one for all the legumes and one for roots. Like carrots and parsnips, but I do stick onions in with them. Now they say plant your onions next to your carrots to confuse the carrot fly. It doesn't work, but I've nowhere else to put the onions, so that's where they go. I've also got, we've got another fruit patch at the top. It's about the same size as them. That's mainly, mainly strawberries, but we're going to have to replace a lot of them. They didn't produce so well this year. I think, you know, they say every three years replace them, so it's coming up to that. But we've got lots of runners, so we can, we can replace all of them. I've also got red currant bush there, which is getting huge. Gooseberries, one gooseberry bush, um, very, very small. We did produce some gooseberries this year, but we didn't get to eat any. So there's a lot of birds up there. We've got two blueberry bushes as well. And unfortunately, I did have raspberries growing there and we took them out, but there's still, there must be bits, you know, still in the soil and they're still popping up all over the blooming place. So there's that. I've got two rhubarb patches which do pretty well. One is usually better than the other. On the other side we've got one apple tree, two little makeshift ponds and I've got a slightly smaller bay than the other ones. I'm not entirely sure how big it is but I've divided that into four. 
one part there is for more strawberries the other part is for herbs I've got another patch where I grow the garlic and the other little one is for mainly courgettes or squashes whatever I need to stick in so it's like a little spare space to put in whatever I need we've got one little polytunnel you know the kind of greenhousey things that you get the green cover that lasts for 10 minutes before it develops holes and um, our cover needs replaced so this year I just didn't have the funds to replace it but I did have some <laughs> bright yellow netting so I sewed that in a, a makeshift cover unfortunately I also had to replace the zip and we will come back to that later so that's just to give you an outline of what I'm dealing with up there so I heard a phrase earlier in the year and it was this uh, have you heard of back to Eden gardening now, I'd never heard of that. No dig I am aware of. I think in America it's called no-till. But basically, you know, you put your compost on the on the ground, just put your compost over, you know, whatever you want to grow, but you don't dig it in. You let the worms, you know, come up and take it in and, that, and they do it for you. The idea being that you just, the more you don't disturb your soil, the healthier it becomes. Now, I'm a big fan of Charles Dowding. I watch him on YouTube. I've, you know, read a few, quite a few of his books. And so I follow him and his gardens. If you've ever seen his gardens on YouTube, they're amazing. Mine don't look like that. Now he does say you can put cardboard down, like a couple of layers, make it quite thick of cardboard. If you've got a lot of weeds and then you put your compost on top. And then after that, that's just the one time you put the cardboard. And after that, every year, you just add on another layer of compost. So I've been trying to do that. But every year, I'm growing more weeds than anything. So I'm still sticking with it because I don't I don't like the idea of digging the soil. And see, to be honest with you, it really hurts my back. It really hurts. I've, I've got back problems, so I don't need to be digging, you know. But this back to Eden gardening that I heard about. I didn't delve into it too deeply. Um, at first I'm thinking, you know, fig leaves and a fork, but no. From what I could see, I was watching a YouTube channel and she said, like, they did their compost, they put their compost down, you know, like the no dig, and then they covered the top with wood chip. And I thought, well, we get wood chip delivered up to the allotment site, you know, the local tree people just dump it there because they'd have to pay to dump it otherwise you know so, so we say yeah we'll take it I thought well I can get all that because I know I don't have enough compost even though I've got I've got three let me think I've got three of those black Dalek compost bins I constructed two lar well, large to me pallet bins and it's still not enough we just never have enough and even though people at like Charles Dowding say, oh yes, I made this compost in April and, I, and I'm spreading it all over in October, I needed to sit there. It seems to take years for my stuff to get ready. And then it's still full of weed seeds, so I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Maybe it just never gets hot enough, I don't know. But yeah, I was thinking I'll I'll do that with the, you know, the wood chip and everything because I thought we don't have enough compost. But then I was thinking, right, what else do I need to use? Because I figured I can make enough compost for one of the the growing bees. And that'll do the, the carrots and the parsnips and the onion part, you know, the roots bee. I thought, I'll put the compost in there. And then I thought, we we'll live, we're on the coast and we've got a great place, just a wee short drive down the road, I'll get seaweed, that'll do the potatoes. Then I thought, we'll go down the park, this is last year, We'll go down the park and we'll get rake up loads and loads of leaves and we'll cover the area that I'm going to be putting the brassicas in because I'm thinking cover the ground, the leaves can, you know, basically decompose into the ground so that'll feed that, They've got, that'll happen and then that'll stop the weeds coming up. So then I decided to use wood chip for the fourth bay for the legumes and I'm looking at this, we did it and I'm looking thinking this looks fantastic. Now when I say we did it it wasn't like done in one day. I didn't get a you know an Instagram shot, for example. I don't do Instagram, but you know what I mean? It wasn't like photo, photo ready. It was done here and there, dribs and drabs. However, it seems to be when these people talk about these fantastic ideas, the one thing they don't mention, or if they do mention, I ignored it, is it really depends on where you live and what kind of climate you have. And we'll be coming to that in just a minute. So I'm going to come to the first lesson. 
because of where I live, which is in the, you know, north of Scotland, it rains quite a lot, as you may have gathered, and it's cloudy. And the rain and the cold brings problems, like snails and slugs. Now, I did not take this into account. When I put the leaves down for the brassicas, I did not take this into account. I did not realise that all those delightful snails, thanks Scooby, all those delightful snails will hide under those leaves. I didn't think about this. And I had three hooped lines, you know, put out my blue hoops, filled them with cabbages and cauliflower, broccoli, you name it, I had it filled. It looked fantastic because I, I, I grow most of my stuff, yeah, pretty much everything from seed really. I do onion bulbs, although I did do some from seed this year. It didn't work out great to be honest. Yes, yeah, so I plant bulb, onions and potatoes, but the rest is all done from seed. So I basically fill my trees in the back garden. When they grow, take them up and pop them in. So I filled these three hooped areas with all my brassicas I thought there'll be no weeds to deal with. Job done. I went back up a few days later. It wasn't even a week. And every single seedling, now some of them are quite big, but every single one of them had gone. Every single one. The bay was empty. The whole bloody bay was empty. And I thought, right, you've got two options. You either drop to your knees and start crying, or you replant. So I took a wee, (laughs) talking about stress, I took a little breather and that's when I realised it's the leaves, they're hiding in the leaves. So I raked all the leaves out again. I threw it round the edges of the plot to try and stop the weeds coming in from next door because that happens a lot. So I had to rake all the leaves away. I replanted. Now the good thing is when you sow your own plants from seed, you are, if you're like me, you are going to over-sow Turns out I had hundreds of cabbages and I needed them. So I replanted all three bays. I replanted the whole thing. Now the problem when I do that, I'm not always that great at labelling. I don't always remember what I put where. When I first put them in, it's fantastic. I know, you know, that's my cauliflower. That's going to be my cabbages. That's going to be my winter cabbage. That's going to be... And I know exactly what I'm doing. But when I had to replace everything... It was really just a case of filling gaps. I put, I would put in a tray here and then I, I thought, oh, oh, I've got a gap. I'll just stick something in and then I don't have the label because I don't have that many labels. If you fill a seed tray, you don't, like say you've got 30 plants in the tray, you don't usually have 30 labels. So th- that was a slight problem. But as they're growing, you kind of tell what they are. But then I thought, right, I need to do something else. And I, for some reason... This year, the one thing I have managed to grow more than anything is thistles. I've never done that before, so I don't, I don't, not entirely sure how that's happened. We've also developed a lovely big nettle patch, so I thought, right, I'm going to put the thistles and the nettles all round the edge of these, you know, the hooped lines. And I also thought, right, what do snails not like? And that's when I came up with the idea of of popping in, you know, the little beetroot seedlings that I had. And I popped them in all round the edges of the brassica rows because I'm thinking snails don't tend to go for beetroot. So if they come in, one, if they make it through the sharp, jaggy barrier of the thistles and, and the nettles, then they're going to be met with beetroot before they even get to the cabbage. So I did that. And I've got to say, not so much the thistles because they obviously just kind of died off and you know rotted, but the beetroot trick really seems to have worked. It's as if, you know, they just maybe smell the beetroot. I don't know. Can snails smell? I haven't looked that closely to see if they have a nose. (laughs) It seems to be the beetroot put them off and the cabbages were okay. So I have learned my lesson. I cannot use leaves as a mulch if I'm going to have a brassica patch. In fact, on our site, I'm going to say I can't use leaves at all because we get a lot of snails and slugs. So leaves are out unless I am going to put them in a big big bag and leave them for leaf mould. That's the only thing I'll be doing from now on. Okay that brings us to the second lesson I learned this year in a big way and we come to wood chip. Now I mentioned it earlier for the back to Eden gardening. 
It's great for the paths. All our paths are covered in wood chip. I cannot use it for growing. Like I said earlier, I put it all over the legume area, planted the peas. Again, we had our little seedlings, planted the peas, put in all the runner beans and all the French beans and thought, good job, walk away. Again, I go back. I've lost all the runner beans. I've lost all the French beans. I replanted several peas. I say I did, actually. The, the, her son actually put the, the peas in and he had to fill gaps. I mean, we did get a reasonable, reasonably good harvest with the peas, but we had to leave them to grow in the seed trays until they were pretty big. You know, so they'd be tougher. But we got no beans gone. So this time, I think... The wood chip has just been a great hidey hole for slugs. And they came along and they munched their way through everything. So, lesson learned. Wood chip can stay on the path. I've actually filled, had a, another wooden bin, which isn't as big as the compost bin, but I've, I've filled that with wood chip. I have heard if you just leave it for a couple of years and let it rot down, then I can use it. But not just as it came with just the wood chip. Like I say, with the rain that we get, it was just fantastic for slugs and snails not doing it again. So that brings me to lesson three, which is really just be careful who you take gardening advice from. You know, I mean, I watch, like I say, I watch Charles Dowding and I do follow a lot of what he does. But he's in the south of England where it's warmer and drier than here even. I mean, he talks about slugs and snails, but up here, even a lot of things that he does... I'm, I can't get away with it, it doesn't work. But his advice is good. Um, thinking more, if you're like me, you watch one video on YouTube and you think, I'm going to do that, because that's what I did. And it didn't work. I need to do more research. That might be a better title, just do more research. But still, you know, be careful. If you see something new, don't do what I did and just jump into it. Do a little bit of research. That's what I'm going to be doing from now on. Okay, lesson number four. This is also a hot tip. I should have a wee do 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 hot tip coming in. You see if you've got a lot of weeds, and this is on an area that you're not going to be growing, you know, veg or flowers in, because we've got an area outside the the fence at the allotment. We've got this, you know, a gate and a fence. Um, we've actually had to put up a locked gate and a fence all the way around because we had problems years back with certain people up there. But so ours is completely enclosed. But at, outside the front fence we get loads of weeds um we have now i don't know if it's couch grass or couch grass i don't know couch grass sounds really rude if you're american i'm going to call it couch grass we have loads of that growing again i've got thistles growing i have this i've been told it's some kind of sorrel and i think it's just it's evil it's the most evil plant it grows up and then it's got like chewing gum runner roots and just under the soil and it sprouts up everywhere you can pick up one wee bit and you've got to follow the trail and of course as you're following ping the damn thing will snap and you know it's going to start growing somewhere else and it suffocates and strangles everything so we get a lot of that so here's what we do salt and vinegar i know it sounds like a bag of chips but it's not Sp I've sprinkle salt all over the front just skip my way down sprinkling the salt skip back the other way oh. Now, if you're hearing that, so Scooby's asleep and he's dreaming. Listen, he barks and he's asleep. Yeah, he's dreaming. Anyway, oh God, I hope I don't have to redo this. I'm not redoing it, you just put up with him. So, put the salt down and then go back over it with vinegar to wash it in and just sit back and watch. The weeds will go brown, they'll die off. It's brilliant. Now, you have to reapply it, if, you know, a couple of weeks later, I'll say like, every three weeks, every you know, once a month or whatever. But instead of having to pull them all out, this stuff really, really works. So I will use that everywhere I can. And it's cheap. Salt and vinegar, well, here it is anyway. So the last big lesson that I learned this year, we come to that polytunnel I was telling you about. Don't... Scooby, shut up! <laughs> that wasn't a lesson. Don't leave a new zip half sewn on. I know it sounds like common sense and it sounds like, you know, why on earth would you do that? But picture the scene, okay? You've got weeding to do, you've got things to plant, you're trying to organise this, you know, this site, this allotment, you're trying to put everything in, you're replanting everything because the bloody slugs and snails are eating it. So sewing on a zip just never really got to the top of the priority list. 
I know I should take more of my own advice but that's just the truth of it and I couldn't replace the whole cover and I got half of it sewn on but there was a bit always flapping at the bottom and I used to try and you know block it with a garden chair or whatever turns out it was just you know an open buffet for snails so we're not getting any cucumbers this year <laughs> um what else did they eat I had two loofah plants I've tried to grow loofah they've gone I did rearrange the polytunnel and I have it set up now the way I want it so I've got when you walk in there's going to be two growing bits along the side left and right in the middle bit at the end I've got a table with all my pots and everything so I mean I've got it organized the way I want it but because I didn't finish the zip yeah I'm paying for that we have lost quite a lot I've got one big tomato plant in there and I just, talking about sticking things in wherever you can get a gap, I stuck a squash plant in there. And be again, because it was in a tray of six plants, and I didn't have six labels. So I've stuck this squash. I know it's a squash, I can tell by the leaves. I have no clue what kind it is. I don't know if it's a trailing squash or what the hell it is. I'm growing it up a string. Yet yeah, this is a kind of chaotic gardener I am at times. I try to be so organised. If you've I actually did a, a video on YouTube about how I do my seeds and how I've got my sheets and how I organise it. I think three people watched it. You know, I get the channel's almost as big as this podcast. It's they're tiny. Nobody sees this stuff. So if you are listening to this, you know, congratulations and thank you. But I did a whole video about how I'm so organised with my seeds and my plan. Somewhere along this gardening journey, the wheels just come off my cart. I just lose it. You know, I get to about, I don't know, middle of July sometimes. Should I be admitting that? Certainly by August, I'm like, oh, just bring the stuff in. I'm tired. So, you know, I've got this plant grown. I think it'll be okay. Now, here, the one success, actually, we have got one very, I think it's going to be quite successful. I do it pretty much every year. We planted two pumpkin plants in the one of the compost bays. They're huge. And we do this every year. They're growing brilliantly. I'm having a competition with our son to see who can get the biggest pumpkin. And so far it looks like he's winning. Can you believe that? The reluctant gardener is actually winning. It's sickening. So anyway, that is the five main lessons that I have learned this year in the garden. If you already knew all this, fair play to you. Um, I, it's like... They always say in gardening, you're always, always learning. You are, we never know. I mean, I've been at this for, I think I worked out, but 11 years. You'd think I'd be a bloody expert by now. I'm really not. And I think if I was only doing the gardening, maybe I'd, I would be better at it. But you know what it's like? You've got so many other things to do. I enjoy the gardening. I look forward to it. I get a lot from it. An expert? Nah. Maybe next year. So I really hope you can take something away from that. And if you've got any great tips that you want to share with me, head over to the blog. I keep saying this. There's a little contact thing at the bottom. You can let me know. Uh, there will be a blog post about this. You can comment on that if you would rather. And if there's somebody that you think would enjoy this podcast or the blog, let them know about it. Any support you can pass along my way would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. So until next time, you take care of your wee self. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the My Slice of Life podcast. Don't forget to look up the blog. It's at myslicemyblog.wordpress.com Also the YouTube channel, which is at My Slice channel. And if you would like to become a patron of the show, go to patreon.com forward slash myslice. Thanks again and I'll see you next week.